Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Stephanie Fox, and I'm a PhD student at the University of New Mexico's Department of Anthropology, where I'm in my fifth year studying evolutionary anthropology. And today I am here with Dr. Michelle Brown as part of a series of features that we are posting for Black History Month. Um, Michelle is an alumni of our department and here to talk about some of her experiences as a Black woman in um, our department and in academia and in primatology more broadly. So thank you very much for being here with us, Michelle. Um, Michelle is currently an assistant professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and a research associate with the Max Planck Institute for Animal Behavior. And she is the co-director of the Anthropology Biobehavioral Laboratory at UCSB and the founder and director of the Ngogo Monkey Project, which is based in Uganda, where she studies an impressive five different species of primate. Before becoming an assistant professor, she did her um, undergraduate degree at Harvard in cognitive science, uh, cognitive neuroscience, sorry. And then she did her PhD and master's at Columbia University in evolutionary anthropology, or sorry, evolutionary primatology. Um, and then she was actually a postdoc at UNM uh, with my advisor, Dr. Melissa Emery Thompson from 2011 to 2014. Um, and um, I'm going to actually turn it over to Michelle to sort of elaborate on my introduction here because I like to hear a little bit more about people than just sort of their current position. So um, Michelle, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about your background in terms of um, where you came from and how you kind of got to where you are now. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, Happy to do that. So it's funny how when somebody introduces another person, it sounds like a nice unbroken chain of events. And that's not how it worked for me. <laughs> uh, there are all kinds of gaps and fits and starts in between. So um, I'm, I'm from the Chicago area and I've always been interested in animal behavior, but for a long time, I couldn't figure out what that would mean career, career wise or if there even was such a thing outside of being a veterinarian or a zookeeper. So. Uh, I was really lucky. There was this chance event, uh, I guess when I was in eighth grade, my dad was a plumber and he happened to be working at somebody's house and they got to talking and that guy who he was talking with had, turned out to be the curator of the Division of Reptiles and Amphibians at the Field Museum of Natural History. And at the time I had two snakes at home and they thought this was great. And so the, the curator, this is Dr. Harold Voris, he had me come into the museum and I started volunteering there and I worked there for six years. So that was really my first uh, exposure to research and what that could look like outside of uh, veterinary work or zookeeping. So that was a really transformative experience for me. And now I'm a huge proponent of long-term mentoring because of the experience that I had. And then when I went to college though, at the time, there weren't really people that I could find, faculty who I could find, who were studying animal behavior, at least not in the biology department. There were some individuals who were studying uh, cognition, animal cognition and psychology, but that wasn't really my main interest. And it was years before I realized that the people who were actually studying animal behavior were in anthropology. And I think this is a common problem at a lot of universities is that students don't know that if they have an interest in animal behavior, a good place for them to go, especially if their university doesn't have an ecology department, is anthropology. And that's because there's a lot of focus on behavioral ecology of humans and non-human primates within such departments. Um, but then, you know, after college, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. And I did not go straight into graduate school. Uh, I worked for four years. So the first year I was volunteering at an orangutan research site in Borneo. And then I came back and worked for the same professor as a stateside research, research assistant. And I wanted to try conservation. So I, I went and worked at Conservation International for a year and a half. And it was during that experience that I really decided that my future was in academia as a research scientist. So that brought me into graduate school and then started to become a little bit more um, seamless, I guess you could say, in terms of pursuing research. 
Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, so I did want to ask you um, today about something that you're, I know you're particularly passionate about changing in academia. And it, you kind of mentioned something in your story there about sort of the luck of meeting somebody who um, kind of opened this little gateway for you that led to your career. Um, and I know that something that you, you're sort of focused on these days is the process of admissions into graduate school and sort of the, the process of um, admitting students, generally speaking, into sort of academic fields, especially in a field like ours where we do a lot of field research, um, where students are kind of expected these days to have experience before coming into graduate school, and they're expected to have field experience as well, which is a big burden to a lot of students um, and can be sort of exclusionary, right? And so I'm just interested to hear your thoughts on that um, and sort of where, where you're at these days on, on that topic. That's a great question. Um, the the pre-grad school field experience is a really crucial element for applying to graduate schools. A lot of universities, their graduate programs are no longer requiring GREs or any kind of standardized test but there's still this expectation that students will have research experience. And if you're planning to get your PhD in a fieldwork intensive discipline like uh, primatology, so many different forms of ecology, biological anthropology, fieldwork experience. Ecology. Yeah, right, lots of different fields. <laughs> the the yeah. fieldwork aspect, that training is still quite important. Um, and that's because this experience tells the student whether this is something that they enjoy enough that they would want to continue doing that. Uh, it's sort of a marker of being able to handle all kinds of unusual and challenging circumstances. But depending on the type of fieldwork experience that students are expected to have, it can be hugely expensive, right? So when I went off to Borneo to volunteer for an orangutan project, the airfare, the uh, visa, the health insurance, food, uh, field supplies, right? You, you, nobody wears jeans into the forest. There's all kinds of special clothing and tools that we're expected to have to, to go into the forest. Uh, and that, that really is a make or break kind of situation. So I had been working part-time for years and years uh, before I was able to go to Borneo to, to participate in that project. And a lot of students, even after working for many years, still don't have the resources necessary to engage in that sort of activity. And when we're talking about primatology in particular, there's often an expectation that, that volunteers will be out there for a fairly long period of time, right? So at least maybe three months, but more typically six, nine, or 12 months. That's a huge ask, right? For somebody to leave their family, their friends for that period of time, usually without any source of income and then having to fork out thousands of dollars just to get there. So um, right now I'm working with some colleagues and we're trying to understand the, the type of experience that faculty expect graduate ap applicants to have. So how long, and what sort of discipline, uh, what is the cost associated with these types of field experiences to really outline for some of our national funding agencies like the National Science Foundation, that there's a funding gap here. This is a problem that can be solved with money. And if we do it right, we can set it up in such a way that these postgrads are paired with individuals who want to be bringing uh, postgrads out to their field sites, and that are invested in mentoring them, preparing them for graduate school, because that's that's a really great time for students to be diving whole hog into the research experience, right? Sometimes as an undergrad, we're so busy taking classes that we don't have a lot of time to participate in research, but after graduation, that could be a really good time to, to get the full experience. Yeah, absolutely. I really like that. Um... You know, you've put so much thought into that, but also like the action is awesome. Way to go. <laughs> um, I also want to ask, like on that note, you know, so this is in progress, um, but there's a there's a time lag. So for students right now who are interested in getting that kind of experience, and for faculty, 
I'm kind of curious to know what your advice is for this sort of period of limbo, maybe before we can get to a place that's more equitable in terms of opportunity. Well, we have to be creative, right? Um, so more faculty when applying for their own research grants can write in money for postgrads specifically, not necessarily undergraduates, not necessarily graduate students, but postgrads to participate in these activities because of that, that critical gap. Um, and for the, the postgrads, I hope that they will keep in mind that the type of fieldwork experience they get doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one match necessarily with the type of research that they plan to do for their dissertation and during graduate school. So for instance, if you think you wanna go out and study primates, that's great, but it's expensive. If you can't afford to go out and volunteer for a year on the other side of the planet, maybe what you can do is get research experience more locally for a slightly shorter period of time. And that will still demonstrate that you have the experience that you need to really demonstrate that you're, you're invested in this process. Yeah, that's actually, that's really good advice on both fronts. And I'm really excited to see how, you know, your work on this topic flourishes hopefully over the next couple of years. Um, yeah. So I also wanted to ask you a question about, so, so we've talked a little bit about sort of that path of getting into graduate school. Um, but I also wanna ask you a bit about your experiences in graduate school, particularly, you know, there's a lot of discussion on campuses right now about inclusion and diversity on campus and trying to both attract more diverse students, but also to retain the more diverse students that they have. And um, a lot of that discussion, I think there's some very practical things that we talk about, like funding, you know, we need to provide stable funding for um, a PhD student who doesn't come from a family of, you know, high economic status where, so that they can be independent. So that's kind of like a very practical thing. But one thing that's a little bit harder, I think, to nail down are, is just like the actual experience of wanting to be there. And I'm curious to know how your graduate experience was in that sense of like feeling welcome on campus as a black woman um, on your campus and, and what you think like maybe we should be keeping in mind when we think about retention in terms of like actually making students feel like they belong and they wanna stay and they're motivated to be there. Yeah. Well, in retrospect, I think I was pretty lucky uh, both when I was in college and in graduate school I was in large cities, right? So Columbia University is in New York. And overall, there is more diversity in New York, right, than we see in a lot of other parts of the country. In my department, it's the ecology department at Columbia, it was also a very diverse space. And so for me, it didn't feel quite that unusual for me to be there. Um, primatology, on the other hand, is a less diverse discipline. Uh, but for me, that was really buffered my, by the fact that my department was uh, very mixed in terms of the composition of students. So that was nice. It, the first time in academia where I really started to get a reception from other in individuals that they were surprised by my presence was as a faculty member here in California. Uh, so again, I, I realized in retrospect, I was fairly lucky in, in graduate school and, and not having had that experience. But for faculty departments who want to make their spaces more inclusive and welcoming to people of color, to black Americans, there's a lot of aspects in which Uh, this process can be made more welcoming to diverse peoples. And part of it is through exposure, right? So who are the students that you're choosing to mentor even as undergraduates, right? Uh, what is the nature of the outreach that you're doing to the public in your area? Who are you having conversations with? Because a lot of the issues that we're seeing in terms of why students don't necessarily want to enter specific fields or leave those fields because they don't feel welcome is because their perspective is not one that's viewed as 
normal or uh, adhering to pre-existing norms. So I think there's a, a really big need for questioning some of our implicit assumptions in terms of what a scientist looks like, what their perspectives are, and then how do we respond when people bring up different ways of viewing a particular issue. Um, so I, I realize that's that's kind of a difficult subject to talk about. Um, but I think that self-awareness is one of the steps. Cohort mentoring is really important. So instead of just bringing in one black student and saying, all right, we've fixed our diversity problem, we need to be thinking about uh, multiple individuals uh, of particular underrepresented groups because no one of us speaks for all of us. Right. Absolutely. Although I really appreciate you speaking on behalf of your community today. Um, um, that's super insightful, Michelle. Thanks so much. Um, I, you can't hear me on Zoom because I put myself on mute going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yes, yes. <laughs> um, I know it is a difficult thing to talk about, though, and a difficult thing to see change overnight. But um, your advice, I think, and insights are spot on. So. Um, the last question that I wanted to ask is about um, just sort of your advice, particularly for the UNM um, graduates and undergraduates and who are in primatology or, or other fields of anthropology. Um, you know, is there sort of one piece of advice that you live by that you'd like to share? Um, yeah, go ahead. Well, maybe I'll make it two pieces of advice. <laughs> sure. so, uh, the first thing, and, and I've seen this as not only important for myself, but important in the careers and lives and trajectories of other individuals is persistence, right? So uh, it's really common to run up against some obstacles, some walls, some challenge. And instead of letting that dissuade you from getting a degree or pursuing academia. We have to say, okay, there's, there's a challenge there. There's a, um, an obstacle and maybe there isn't an immediate way for me to break it, break it down, but there might be a way to get around it. And there might be a way to just sort of hang tight for a little while until the situation changes because sometimes these obstacles are really not under our own control. And even if it's not an obstacle, sometimes we just need a little extra time, right? So my process in which I went from college to working for four years before going into graduate school, that time off, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, that was a really useful set of experiences for me. And uh, I think a lot of students probably could benefit from similar sorts of experiences. And so that's, I knew that I was interested in research. I wasn't convinced it was the path for me, but being willing to come back to the idea of pursuing a career in academia, that is the persistence part of my advice that that really has been crucial to me throughout my um, uh, trajectory. The second thing I would say is that, and this is very much from my own experience, the, the thing that keeps me afloat through thick and thin is my interest in the research and the questions that I'm addressing. So if, if these weren't things that I really enjoyed thinking about and talking about and speculating and designing research projects to address and then doing the analyses on the data that I've collected, it wouldn't be worthwhile for me. So if you find yourself really drawn to specific questions, that hopefully should be motivating your persistence no matter what sorts of obstacles are uh, in your path. I agree. And I'm also going to take that advice. <laughs> That's good advice. Yes. Um, okay, Michelle, thank you so much for spending some time with me today and contributing to our Black History Month features um, for the UNM Department of Anthropology. Um, it's been a pleasure. I appreciate all of your insight and your advice. Um, and I hope that we get to chat again soon. Hopefully it won't be too long. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Great to yeah. see you.
Okay, I'm just going.